Hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here remotely. Uh, my name is Kennedy Shaw. I'm the CEO of Rejuve Biotech. Um, I'm broadcasting to you from Orange County, California, from the Methuselah Fly Lab. Those are the Methuselah flies in those cages behind me. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about um, deciphering longevity using insights from our Methuselah flies and advanced artificial intelligence. Um, Rejuve Bio is a spinoff company of Singularity Net, which is um, also now part of the ASI Alliance led by uh, Ben Gertzel. So we are developing our AI alongside um, Singularity Net and uh, Ben Gertzel and uh, his amazing um, insights and, and philosophy on, on AI and, and AGI. So um, my, my background is in evolutionary biology and genetics. I trained at UC Irvine with Michael Rose. Um, some of you might have heard of him. He's a uh, considered, fan. what? He's a big fan. Yeah, big fan. Yeah, Michael Rose is considered by many to be a, a father of the longevity field. He is credited with coining the term antagonistic pleiotropy, um, which is a theory of uh, of certain genes being um, beneficial early in life and then being detrimental later in life and thus creating the reason why we age from an evolutionary perspective. Um, and so Dr. Rose started the world's longest evolutionary biology experiment that is still running today, the Methuselah Fly Project. Um, we started selecting these flies in 1980 by taking the longest lived flies from each generation and letting them contribute to the next generation. And over 44 years now and 400 generations, um, we have flies that now have an average lifespan of about 135 days. And we have two groups of Methuselah flies. So we have the original O flies, which have an average lifespan of about 70 days. And then um, in 2008, I took a group of the O flies and continued to apply selective pressure to them. And now we have the super Methuselah or super O flies that have a much longer lifespan. And I'm continuing to select them for longevity even today. Um, so these flies provide a treasure trove of um, genetic information. This is what a surv typical survivorship curve looks like uh, for females. The male one looks pretty similar. So you can see a really nice delineation between our control group here, the original Methuselah flies, and then our, our super Methuselah flies um, as, they, as they die off. And we have five replicate populations of, of, each, of each cohort. So the Methuselah flies, when we delve into their genomics and transcriptomics, we find a lot of differences. And typically we find a mutation burden of about 20% of um, in the Methuselah flies versus our control flies. Um, one interesting thing is that the original Methuselah flies, the O flies have slightly more mutations than the, the super O flies. Um, we believe that that suggests that maybe the super O flies have honed in on some of the more beneficial mutations, and so they have slightly less, um, but we have more experiments planned to, to figure out exactly why that is. And what's interesting about that in relation to studying longevity in humans is that when you look at supercentenarians in relation to the general human population, you find that the mutation burden is also about 20%. Um, eyeballing that. So it's kind of an interesting parallel that we find between the, the Methuselah flies and the control flies and supercentenarians versus control humans. Um, doing some transcription factor analysis um, of these populations, we've found some really nice delineation in expression that separates these populations really nicely. And we've zeroed in on some on four specific transcription factors that are highly active in our super Methuselah flies um, and suppressed in our control flies. And um, what's interesting about these, these four transcription factors is that they also seem to um, uh, suppress downstream these other transcription factors that are, uh, that are highly active in our control flies. And a lot of these transcription factors are things that have to do with developmental processes. So this also um, 
supports uh, some of the antagonistic pleiotropy theories and some theories put forth by one of our advisors, Jao Pedro Damogles, about those um, kind of runaway developmental processes um, early in life that are beneficial being detrimental early and uh, being detrimental later in life. It appears that the super Methuselah flies um, have uh, have have uh, developed a way to sort of calm down some of those developmental processes later in life so that they're not so deleterious to them and they are able to live longer. Um, but we have more experiments planned to um, figure out exactly what what is going on here. But you can see there's there's actually quite a nice um, delineation between between the different populations and the activity and expression of these transcription factors. So um, in our functional analysis, what we basically find is that the the Methuselah flies overall have have better metabolic function than the bee flies. Um, we have better representation in in carbohydrate metabolism, in ion transport processes, ATP metabolism, um, better uh, aerobic respiration, mitochondrial processes. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, like we said about the about controlling some of the developmental processes later in life, the super Methuselah flies have. Um, less representation compared to the control flies when it relates to DNA replication and cell division. Um, so that kind of makes a little light bulb go off that they've kind of figured out how to not let those developmental processes run away and you know cause things like cancer later in life. So where does the AI come in? So with our, uh, our partners at SingularityNet, um, we are developing some advanced neurosymbolic architecture called OpenCog Hyperon, which uh, centers around a bioatom space, which is a knowledge metagraph, um, a self-organizing, self-modifying um, graph of graphs where uh, you can take seemingly unrelated data and use multiple AI algorithms and agents to find patterns in that um, unrelated data and see what's in there. What's really great about this in biomedical research is that oftentimes we are lacking data, data might, sets might be too small, or there's various holes in the data for whatever reason. Um, the way that this um, advanced AI is structured is that it works more like a human brain so that these multiple AI algorithms work together to kind of plug in those holes and you can still get a viable answer. You can still get some reasoning, a hypothesis to work with to advance your, your research. And so this is something that we are developing with our partners at SingularityNet and another one of their spinoffs, um, True AGI. Um, and it's also being uh, developed as, as a platform. So a nice little primordial proof of concept that um, we could say for this is an earlier version of this AI um, that Ben Gertzel developed um, about 12 years ago now, we actually used to study the genome, genome and transcriptome of the Methuselah flies and compare it to publicly available human data sets. And we used it to identify um, common pathways that were involved in neurodegenerative disorders. And at this time, specifically, we were looking for, for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. We also use the AI to identify traditional Chinese medicines and herbs that might act on those pathways. And um, we did hundreds of fly trials in the lab. I looked for a combination of substances that um, made my control flies live longer, that didn't damage my um, super Methuselah flies, that uh, worked in a uh, fly model of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, restoring their crawling ability and restoring their lifespan to normal. And you can see that in this, this crawling assay right here, um, it restored their calling ability and restored their, their uh, lifespan to normal. We actually then did an IRB approved pilot at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach at the Neurosciences Institute, where we added this supplement that was all made of things on the FDA gra grass list to a, um, a, a cohort of Alzheimer's patients, uh, just to their normal regimen of drugs that was kept stable throughout 15 months. 
And in our mild to moderate patients, we saw that their cognitive function as measured by the CER, some, some of boxes, stayed pretty close to baseline, just adding this, this natural supplement um, to, to their normal regimen of, of drugs. Um, and so this was, this was a supplement that was, that was AI um, selected and developed and in, um, from an older version of the platform that we're developing now. Um, obviously it's, it's more advanced and, and better now. So we're hoping to do more of these types of, of studies. And, uh, we still have this supplement available that, um, we will be manufacturing and distributing, and then also using it as a jumping off point, um, for, for drug discovery itself to see what's, what's really going on there. So we have used the, the AI to go through flies, to go to humans and, you know, didn't hurt anybody and possibly help some people. So as I said, we are developing the um, AI as a end-to-end -end research platform as well. Um, the neurosymbolic architecture combined with the uh, bioatom space uh, makes it possible for us to to help with everything from basic science research to translational medicine, all the way through drug discovery, through hypothesis generation, um, making inferences, actually reasoning. And um, not only can you query the AI and it gives you a nice little, um, this is an example of a, a causal hypothesis tree, tree between a, a gene and a um, phenotype that's produce, produced by that gene. Um, but it will also be able to generate nice reports for you of why it got the answer that it did. So it's not a black box generative AI type of um, platform. So we're hoping that uh, researchers will be more inclined to use it since it can generate a nice report that you can file alongside your, your IND or your clinical trial uh, paperwork with, with the FDA. So that's what we have on the horizon for, for our AI that we're developing with SingularityNet. And then our next steps in the lab and um, <clears throat> and uh, and with Singularity Net is a continued analysis. We want to do mitochondrial analysis on the flies and phenotypes and expression phenotype studies, and some more advanced techniques, uh, supervised mixomics methods with the bioatom space, um, longitudinal studies. We want to take uh, transcriptome and uh, genomes of the Methuselah flies at various life stages to see exactly how things change throughout their life um, and some integrated multiomic modeling using OpenCog Hyperon, the new neurosymbolic architecture from, from SingularityNet, um, integrating pathways uh, from genetic and transcriptomic data to identify crucial longevity pathways that we can target to actually develop uh, therapeutics for aging related diseases. So yeah, so that's what we have on, on tap for the next uh, year or so. so. With that, I want to say thank you to Addie for inviting me and um, and Misha for for organizing my my call in. If anybody has questions, you can email me at either one of those two addresses, and um, I'm very happy to to respond and take any questions. So yeah, thank you, Kennedy. I think we, uh, if you have time yourself, we can maybe do three really good quick questions if anybody has. Yeah, sure. Um, going back to the actual way you're modeling, um, just one quick clarification and then a question. Clarification sure. is when you're modeling, are you testing these new substances on a model to fly, or are you using OpenCob to create new substances and then testing them on actual flies? And then, um, sorry, go ahead. And the full question is what's the difference between what you're finding uh, with? algorithmically generated uh, drugs and supplements versus with human determinants? Um, so the first part, so in the case of the, the Alzheimer's supplement that we developed, um, we actually, it was a, it was a version of um, open, it was open cog classic that was used to select that supplement. So it was a much older, it was an older version of oh, Hyperon is the new version of the architecture. Um, and so it was, it, basically just selected a group of substances that was most likely to work on the uh, Alzheimer's pathways that it also selected. But we did like hundreds of fly trials testing all of those in um, 
in different combinations and different um and different doses. And we did use a fly model for, for Alzheimer's disease that was developed um, in partnership with uh, Professor John Tower at Keck Medicine at USC. And so that was an actual um, transgenic um, mifprestone induced fly model for, for Alzheimer's that um, flies that produce the uh, beta amyloid protein and um, tau as well. And it worked in both of those, the, both of those models. And then, um, sorry, can you repeat the second part of your question again? Question is, what's the difference between uh, outputs, like qualitatively, what's the difference between outputs from algorithmic sources versus human sort of first principles inspired by humans? Um, the different, sorry, the differences in like success rates or? Uh, not so much in success rates as in actually like the kinds of things that it finds. Oh, the kinds of things that it finds. Um, you know, I, uh, I mean, we, I mean, there, so in this particular study, cause we worked very closely with several longevity physicians and a cardiologist and the, the substances that we had honed in on through manual literature and genomic research on our own were actually, um, very similar to the pathways and substances that the AI selected, um, I, if I, my memory serves me correctly, I'd say the list at that time was about 80% similar. Um, now, uh, it, now it's, it's, now it's probably closer to 90% is probably what I'd say, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? One over there. Uh, I was wondering how, like, um, Symbolic AI approaches like, hold up when you have like uh, like more like incomplete like epistemic information like in the case of say like uh, like God microbiome like how like you don't know like sort of like how complete picture of the sort of like the, the things that you're working with like how useful like can the um, symbolic approach to be? Yeah. Um. Well, the the theory with the symbolic approach is that there are um and full full disclosure i'm i'm not an ai scientist i'm literally just a biologist <laughs> so all the all the ai stuff that i know ben gertzel has literally taught me um, <laughs> so uh from, and so the way that it's been explained to me cuz i have asked that question before is that the um other ai algorithms that are working together synergistically would be able to um generate some um synthetic data that would fill in the gaps that would be appropriate to the problem that they are solving or the query that's that's been asked of of the system um and uh based on the the biological uh systems modeling that we've designed the system to do it should uh it should give a a relatively um accurate answer it's, that's that's how it's been explained to me so one more question on once, on twice. Good. All right, awesome. That'll be it. Thank you, Kennedy. That's it. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yes. Next next time we'll right. we'll get you in person on lunch. Yeah. Program. Yeah. Next time in person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye.